Welcome to Conversations. I'm Tom Shorkey, your host for today's program. Conversation explores the past, the present, and the future of the communities in which we live. And we do it through the insights and through the eyes of individuals who have contributed to the quality of life that we know in our area. Today's guest on Conversations is Mike McCartan. Mike, good to see you again. Nice to be here. Mike, as just a little background, you've worn so many hats over the years. You've been part of this community, and just a, a couple bases to cover. How long have you actually been in Sinclair? Uh, we came here in 1976. Um, been in the same house ever since. My kids went to uh, Sinclair High School, and graduated, and they're in their 30s now. So uh, I, I think by St. Clair standards, I'm still a, a newbie. Um, a gentleman at CVS the other day asked me what house I lived in, and I described where I was. And he says, oh, that's the old Frederick's house. Yeah. So uh, 40 years living in the same house, apparently it's still on mine. <laughs> that's right. Oh, there must have been a lot of Frederick's. People ask me where I live, and I tell them, and they say, well, that's Frederick's house. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. That we have something in common there. Mike, uh, most of your professional career was uh, as director of community mental health uh, for St. Clair County. Um, it hasn't been, uh, you know, highlighted much lately uh, in the papers, but community mental health in, in the county, what does that mean? What are some of the issues that you had to deal with? Well, it, actually, it, is, it has changed dramatically. Uh, I tell people I started on April 1st, April Fool's Day, 1975. Uh, in a little trailer behind the 72nd District Court building in, in uh, Marine City. And if you look up April 1st, 1975, there was a huge snowstorm. So I missed my first day of work, which was not a great start to, to begin with. And about a month later, I arrived there, and it was covered with these beasts that I'd never seen before. It turned out they were fish flies. Uh, but where I came from, we never had fish flies. And I was afraid to get out of my car uh, because I, th I thought these things were, they looked big enough that they could probably carry you away. But fast, go back to April 1st, 1975. Um, community mental health was in its infancy. It was about three years old at the time. And we had about 1,300 St. Clair County residents in state hospitals throughout the state of Michigan, places that no longer exist like Pontiac State Home and the Oakdale Center over in Lapeer. Um, and those were people who had gone there, um, sent by their parents. Oakdale, for example, had a a nursery on site and a graveyard on site. There were people who went there when they were infants and died there as, as adults. And it was the thing to do back then. At least we felt it was the thing to do. And so if, if you were a parent and had a child with a disability, you were probably told that that child would be better with other kids uh, you know, who were a lot like him, with people who were trained. Uh, but what we know from looking back uh, over time was that those places were pretty horrific and that the things that we did in those places, Oakdale, for example, had dormitories with 50, 60 beds lined up in a row uh, with pe people who were chained to their beds, lying in their feces. Uh, back then, we used to do experiments of related to cosmetics on people with developmental disabilities to see what effect they would have on individuals. It, it, was, a, it was a different era and a different time. Um, so when I started, uh, the people with severe illnesses were not in our community. They were away. They were put away. They were sent away. Uh, and so a lot of what I did then was you know, what we call case finding, almost trying to invite people to come in because uh, the stigma related to mental health uh, that we have today, we had it even to a higher degree back then. But um, So I started off in Marine City, uh, and then we had a branch in... Algonac uh, at the uh, rectory, St. Catherine's Rectory. Um, and it tells you how long I've been around. A number of places I've worked are now parking lots, uh, <laughs> as is the rectory, which is across from what used to be the Alg Algonac Elementary School, but it's a parking lot now. And, you know, that was really the beginnings. There was three or four of us, and, um, you know, we did what probably would be called counseling today. Uh, Ten years later, there was a federal decree that said basically... Uh, the state had to prove why you needed to be in a state hospital versus the opposite, which was you proving why you shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. And so we began what was community placement. And uh, today, there are four people from St. Clair County who are in a state hospital someplace. Most of the state hospitals are, have been closed. And we haven't cured mental illnesses, and we haven't eliminated developmental disabilities. But what we've done is we've learned how to take care of our own people 
in a different way than we used to. So we've got well, group did homes. Did it put a lot of pressure on? I think it was probably the early 90s when a lot of hospitals were closed mm -hmm. or the state quit funding them or whatever and put a lot of uh, mentally challenged mm -hmm. people with a variety of disorders back on the street. Has community mental health been able to keep up with that? I would say no. Uh, I think initially the, the, the plan was and the theory was that whatever resources were being spent on these people in the state hospital would follow them into the community. And state hospitals were expensive at the time, so the resources that came into the community uh, more than were able to take care of those folks. A lot of them went to group homes. A lot of the six-bed group homes that we have throughout the county um, go back to, there's, there's one on Vine Street in St. Clair that probably goes back to 1980, maybe 1981. Uh, it was amongst one of the first. Uh, but when we began doing that, there was a tremendous uproar and uh, kind of a not in my backyard mentality mm -hmm. about who these people were. And it was, it was born out of ignorance. And I don't mean that in the negative pejorative way, but the lack of understanding of who these people were and, you know, and whether they were dangerous or they weren't dangerous. And, and they weren't. What they were was unsocialized uh, because they were living in these large communities where you had to fight for your meal. Uh, you had to fight for everything that you got. It was constant struggles. You were never out in the community. So, you know, I can recall early in my career taking people to McDonald's and Burger King, and it was I might as well have been taking people to the moon because they'd never experienced something like that. So initially, I think we did a pretty good job of, of taking care of people. Not so much anymore. Um, there are people, there's a number of people who are on the street who have mental health problems, uh, but who are not dangerous to themselves or others. And, and people, I, don't, I think, don't understand sometimes that unless you're deemed to be dangerous to yourself or others, you have every right to behave in as you know, strange a way as you want to. Uh, and we can't do anything about it. I get calls that I used to frequently about, you know, so-and-so is, is going around town shouting or, you know, doing bizarre and strange things. And, you know, why aren't you guys doing something or in a business and, you know, being disruptive. And the reality was that, you know, if, if John didn't want our help, uh, and in many cases John had had our help and didn't want it anymore, but if he didn't want to and he wasn't breaking the law, you know, there wasn't much that we could do. So I, I think there's some frustration with that, and I think, you know, certainly some of these tragedies that have come up uh, fairly recently, you know, the, the conventional belief is that these are people, you know, who have, uh, have mental illnesses. The truth of the matter is that hardly ever is that the case. I mean, typically if somebody got arrested for something that was violent uh, and the belief was that they had a mental illness, then they would be sent for an evaluation. And less than 2% of people who are evaluated by forensic folks uh, for mental illnesses are deemed to be mentally ill. The rest come back and stand trial for their crimes. Uh, a mental illness is, is not an excuse or does not relieve the, the responsibility that has, somebody has for committing a crime. So um, people who have mental health problems are far more likely themselves to be victimized than they are necessarily to be a perpetrator of a crime. And that is interesting. Now, Mike, you were probably the director of the county community health program for approximately 30 years. Mm -hmm. what, what would you look at as maybe one of the major accomplishments in, that occurred in the area of, of mental health during, during that 30 year period? I would say it was the sophistication of psychotropics, the medicine. Uh, the, the medicines that used to be given to people who had mental illnesses, yeah, they, they worked on the mental illness, but their side effects were pretty gruesome. Uh, we talked about things like tardive dyskinesia, you know, which people were bumped over or unable to speak properly. And, and, and the, the medicines, I wouldn't say were killing them necessarily, but they certainly weren't healthy. Uh, and they were very generally targeted at symptoms. Whereas now we have medicines that are um, fairly mild, that, can, that are used only to the extent necessary, have far fewer side effects, which make it more likely that people will actually take their medicine. You know, when, when the cure is worse than the disease in the view of the person taking the medicine, uh, they stop taking it. Uh, when, when it's not that case, then they are far more likely to, to, to continue to take the medicine. I, I, would, I think that's probably, probably the biggest advantage. 
along with perhaps a little more public education, I think a little less stigma attached to uh, having a, a depression or a bipolar disorder. Um, we still have a long ways to go, but I do think there is more awareness, generally speaking, about, you know, if I have an issue, there are places I can go and I can get help, and there are things that work. What about, as you concluded your 30 years in your previous role, was there something you scratched your head about and said, I wish I could have done more about a particular issue? Is there just a frustration out there that you just, something we just couldn't get at in the area of mental health? I think there's a number of things. Um, one certainly is suicide prevention. Uh, you know, we have about two suicides a month in St. Clair County every month, every year. Um, suicide is something that doesn't have to happen. It's preventable, yet it does happen. We know who's committing suicide by and large. It's, it's white males between 25 and 45, but we haven't been able to get to them. And so we have these tragic situations that um, I, it's very frustrating to see that that certainly would be, would be an area. The other area which I think is going to emerge in the next four or five to 10 years as, as major, which is the use of opioids. Uh, we have now young generations of kids who are, are, are beginning to take things like uh, Vicodin and Oxycontin, et cetera. They're getting hooked on them, uh, but they're expensive. On the street, they're expensive to buy. And the next place that folks are going is to heroin, and heroin is extraordinarily cheap. We have an epidemic of heroin use in our, in our county, and it's not by the down and outers. It's by the 25-year-old who, at 17 or 18, was going to parties and taking pills and getting hooked on stuff, can't afford it anymore, and is now you know, going out and, and A, trying to get prescriptions for uh, painkillers. And I think doctors are much more uh, wary of, of that. But you can talk to a pharmacist and talk about these 25, 26-year-old kids coming in buying syringes, you know, under the guise that, that it's, you know, it's for their grandmother who's got diabetes or, you know, whatever. And it, it isn't. That the use of bad heroin. I mean, there's fentanyl that's in heroin. It's a, it's a growing problem. And you know, we have rashes of home invasions. And you know, Sheriff Donlan will tell you that many of those are related to people going into homes looking for prescription drugs. You know, we have real estate folks who are being told, you know, if you have an open house, be, be sure that the owners know that people are going to open houses for real estate to just to go chest. into your medicine chest to see what you've got. Um, we have a mentality, I think, particularly with our older people of, you know, don't throw it away. You, you know, you might need it someday. So we have hundreds and thousands of pills being stashed away in people's homes that, you know, they, they, they don't want to use them. It, it's very frustrating to see the emergence of that kind of an issue. And, you know, basically, I think for the average person, a, a lack of recognition that, it, that it's even there. And so... You know, you can't solve a problem that you don't believe exists. So, I mean, our challenge is how do we get people to understand that there is this emerging problem that's out there that, that we really need to do something about. And it's a young person's problem. It's not an older person's issue. Well, now, because you've had this challenging career in community mental health, about three years ago, you retired from your position. You were off duty for about three weeks, and then they, they tabbed you to be a regional director for a number of counties, which I believe goes as, as far west as Genesee County and Sanilac County and St. Clair County, Lapeer, et cetera. Now, besides just looking at St. Clair County, do you see commonalities across those counties with problems, or does Sanilac have a different set of issues than, say, a Genesee would have? I would say, by and large, you know, when it, for example, the opioid problem, it's everywhere. Everybody has that problem. It, the, the demographic is a little bit different, so yeah, that's the case. Um, the suicide prevention problem, everybody's got that problem. It's, 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 throughout, you know, it's throughout the region. You know, certainly in Flint, the issues related to, to, to poverty and uh, housing and those kinds of things are much more pronounced than they are in Sandusky, for example. Uh, you know, Sanilac County would have you know, less of an issue related to that. But in Sanilac County, it's very rural, very isolated. People tend to suffer quietly and don't seek the services that they, they might otherwise be uh, able to take advantage of. So it's, it's, you know, 
People are people. They always have been. Well, you've you've kind of led this life as a, uh, a problem solver or crisis management, however you'd like to term it. And then just for the fun of it, 1989, you said, well, I'll volunteer to be on the school board. And you spent about 25 years in... Well, actually, I hold you tree. responsible for that. So. I, I thought you <laughs> might. I'd like to mention you were superintendent, or about to be the superintendent at the time. And, and uh, yeah, those were, for folks who were around then, kind of troubled times. And it felt, I felt like, you know, it was, it, I could contribute. I, you know, I could, I could do something. And fortunately, I didn't have to run for that office back in the beginning. I, I was named to it, so it, that made it easy enough. And I would say of all of the things that I've done, um, that probably, the, the tenure on the school board, probably gave me more satisfaction than any other one opportunity that, I, that I've had. I, you know, I, I, I look back, of course I got unceremoniously removed in, in the last election, but... That happens to the best of them. Yeah, a friend of mine said, you know, as you go through life, you'll, you'll, you'll make a few friends, which you'll collect a lot of enemies. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I think people probably were, it, maybe it was time for a change, but, you know, when I look back on some of the really difficult decisions that we had to make, um, I never made one, not, not a single one, hoping that it would help me get reelected to the school board. Um, and, and a lot of decisions were really tough. Uh, I would say probably on the top of that list was always expulsions. You know, mm -hmm. These kids who didn't wake up in the morning wanting to screw up, but somehow managed to get there before the sun set. Uh, and you know, we we're making lifetime decisions for them. And, and I think we did a remarkable job of, of creating opportunities for many of those kids to return and turn their lives around. And, and I know many of them did. Um, but, you know, closing schools and redrawing boundaries and eliminating programs and things like that. But um, Passing bond issues. Really passing bond whatever. issues, yeah. But they, 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 there, was, there was a satisfaction in knowing that you could, you, you, if you had to make the right decision, you made it at the time. And, and you know, and I think in your tenure and, and even beyond that, you know, we avoided the death by a thousand cuts. Mm -hmm. You know, it was if there was bad news in the envelope, let's open it, let's deal with it, let's move on. Our kids are resilient. You know, it was always the the adults always seem to have to struggle with making change. The kids seem to be pretty resilient. I, I found that in my experiences, not only East China, poor here in Royal Oak, that uh, usually the the kids are are fine with whatever school they go to, but the adults get a little excited. But that's a whole nother story. Let's take a different tack, Michael. You know. One of the things, if, if we pick up anything in the papers nowadays or on the political campaign trails, immigration seems to be a big deal. And what I think a lot of our listeners don't realize is you were, what, 13 or 14 before you came to the United States? Uh, I'm one of them. Little Irish boy. Give, it, give us a little back. Early years in Ireland, what was that? Like. It was, you know, it, it was interesting. I, 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 every immigrant's story is a little bit different. And mine, I, it was a little unusual, too, in that my parents immigrated when I was four. Um, and they were no skills, came to America looking for jobs, looking for work, just like everybody did back then. Uh, most people in where I grew up in the west coast of Ireland immigrated. I mean, that's really what we did. Um, and I, had, I, I was sent to live with my uncle, uh, which I thought was normal at the time, I guess in retrospect it seemed a little different. And I had two sisters who went to live with my uh, grandparents on either side. And the, the, the plan was that in a year or two we'd come over. Well, um, not unlike today, there were issues back then about immigration, people who didn't have any skills who were coming taking jobs from people who did, etc. And so it took nine years uh, before wow. we were able to, uh, uh, to come here as, as a group. So on August 7th, 1963, I went to Dublin, was introduced to my two sisters who I hadn't seen for a long time. We were put on a plane with a picture of my mother, uh, who we hadn't seen for Incredible. the nine years. And uh, we, I, I recall vividly, we landed in New York, and it was then when uh, they didn't have the thing that came out to take the passengers off. There was little steps that came down mm -hmm. on the tarmac. And we were mini celebrities by five hours in the air. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew who we were and we had an assigned stewardess. And so we were all at the window with this photograph of this very slight woman 
um, looking out to see if we could match up. And lo and behold, this lone soul came out of the building because they knew there as well and came out to meet us at the bottom of the, the, the steps. So, you know, from there, uh, you know, we came to, to Dearborn, Michigan. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I think it set the stage for the rest of my life. Um, you can, November 1963, Kennedy was assassinated, and he was as close to a, an icon in Ireland as oh, probably yeah. the Pope or whatever. <laughs> uh, I'd seen television twice in my life to that point. Once was an episode of the Flintstones at the parish priest's house because he had bought a television. Uh, and the other was going into town to see uh, President Kennedy's speech in Galway, which was about 40 miles away, where you know he sort of declared himself to be, you know, Irish by choice or whatever. So it, it, I mean, it was, you know, I'm I'm 13 going on 14. I've got freckles, pimples, and an accent. Um, you know, p people want to take me home so that their parents can hear me talk. Uh, that was really that was my value. And, I, you know, I was profoundly lonely, um, helpless, hopeless, uh, no sense of attachment. Um, you know, I hadn't, didn't really know my parents or, or my sisters. I, you know, I felt abandoned. And all of those things, as I reflect 40 years later, were what allowed me to choose to be with people for my career who felt or who feel that way a lot. And you know, I had the ability, I think, because of that experience, to um, to not be able to say I know how you feel because I, I know how people react when you say yeah. that, but I know what it feels like to be an outsider, to be different, to to feel different, to feel alone, et cetera. And so I think it set the stage for 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 my career. You know, I I, I found out then sometime later that. You know, I had some skills and some talents, and, and when I choose, chose to focus on those, um, you know, by the time I, I got to high school, I, I ended up being president of my class in the 11th grade, and it was primarily because I didn't know what cool was. I mean, I, I wasn't sophisticated enough to know that you don't hang out with, you know, we had greasers and frats back then. You don't hang out with the greasers, you know, you're cool, I was in sports, and but that, you know, when I mm. ran for president, these these clowns in, in voted most for cases, you? they all voted for me and so I won by a landslide yeah. but I discovered there that you know that connection that you make with people who feel disconnected is is it's it's a it's a skill it's a talent it's a gift that you can't bestow on yourself it's bestowed on you by other people and it served me well throughout my entire career. I've you know, which is a great segue for the, you know, the question I usually ask is, who was the influential teacher you had? Or maybe it doesn't necessarily have to be a teacher. Was there some adult that was influential in your life along the way of being the new kid on the block when you were 13 or 14 to growing into the man you are today? Was, it, was there a person or two that really made a difference in your life? Well, it certainly was the uncle who raised me. You know, I look back on that and he'd been married for maybe a year and a half or two years, had a six month old child in his house. By the time he left, I left, he had five more. But he, he took me in and I was a part of that family. It was a tiny village. He was a school teacher, but he was also kind of like the wise man in the, in the village. He was the one that people came to. Um, we were one of the first houses in the village to have electricity and that light was never off. And, and the significance of that was that if you were walking by, driving by, riding your bike by, and the light was on, it was almost expected that she came in, mm -hmm. and you said hello and had a cup of tea and whatever. And we, we were on a kind of a sort of a main road, but um, back then the you know the the exports from Ireland, you know, they call it the island of saints and scholars. There was a lot of priests and nuns who had went abroad to. Africa and Australia and North America and whatever. And when they came back, they would they would stop in to Joe Mulrooney's house. And I always got to be sitting in the corner listening to these stories of, you know, whatever, adventure or uh, differences. And, and I, I generated, I think, a world view then that, that ha was very helpful. But it was that kind of, everybody, you can talk to anybody, you know, you, you, you're, you're you're put here to, to serve people. And it's not being Pollyanna, it's not that you know you don't get anything out of it, you get more out of it than you put into it, but there is a responsibility of citizenship to serve. And and I think, you know, Joe 
Mulrooney certainly taught me uh, that. And, and he was, a, you know, he was a quiet leader as well. I, I stole a little Chinese poem from him after, actually I'd gone back for his funeral when, when he passed away. And this thing was printed and my wife more recently had it printed for my office. But it talks about leadership and, and, and the, the, the best leader, the most effective leader is the one that leads without people knowing it, and they think they did it themselves. Mm -hmm. and that, you know, and I think that that was always my goal. You know, I've been in the limelight a lot, but I never, you know, sought it or, frankly, enjoyed it all that much. I'm not mm -hmm. that comfortable with it. But I learned, that, you know, never to let them see you sweat. And I think that was, you know, that was a Joe Mulrooney kind of thing as well. Great story. Yeah. Speaking of never letting you see you sweat. Everybody in this community has watched you sweat because I think up until about five or eight years ago, you were out on the side of M29 almost every day running 10 or 15 miles. Yeah. Uh, um, what was that all about? And I, you know, I, I'm, I think it, in some ways, you know, so I'll go back to 1963. I arrived in, in Dearborn. Uh, I tried out for the football team the first week I was there. I'd never seen a football game never seen a football. I had no clue what this was about. And Coach Robinson didn't even take the time to learn my name. He called me Irish. <laughs> and the only thing he found out that I could do was kick. And so yeah. I became the kicker on the team. Well, I played soccer. I was a pretty good soccer player when I was a kid. Uh, but nobody played soccer. I mean, whatever. So all I was, the only thing left that I could do was run. And uh, so it became, you know, the, the, the place that I went to to hide probably in some cases. It was the place where I was in control, uh, that I could, you know, work as hard or as little as, as I wanted to. And so, you know, I had a pretty successful career when I was in, in high school and then I went off and ran in, in college for three of my four years. I played soccer, uh, you know, my senior year. Uh, and then I got into more long distance running. So, you know, I've run 79 marathons and uh, bunch Any of Boston, Boston marathons along five, the way? Five Bostons oh, and right. run Dublin and Toronto and New York and you know, whatever. I mean, it was, it was, you know, Sunday mornings, God forgive me, I didn't always go to church, but if I went out for a 10, 15 mile run, I felt as spiritual as I think anybody who was darkening the doors of St. Mary's at the time. And then as you've worked your way through your life and your career, you don't seem to run as much, but it seems like you get on stage at least once a year. Uh, give us a little bit on your acting. Uh, well, I, I fell into that. It's another one of those things where probably, it's about 10 years ago now, uh, somebody had come to me at Community Mental Health and said, you know, not everybody expresses themselves with words. That's kind of our stock and trade as we use words. Uh, there's other ways. And so, you know, the arts and whatever. So he said, oh, yeah, that's, we can have a writing class and we can have a, an art class. And then somebody said, well, shouldn't we have like theater or drama or something like that? And uh, like, well, who's going to do it? You know, look around. And so I volunteered uh, to, to get into a play. And so we, we created this troupe out of people who used our services, consumers as we refer to them, staff people who work at CMH. A lot of them were all high school want to be actors, and then some community people. And, you know, 18 or 10 years later, 18 productions, 16 of which I've been in, uh, I, I get a chance to be, you know, I've been Scrooge, which was marvelous. Chris Kringle, which was wonderful. I was Harvey, the guy with the imaginary bunny, which was Harvey. I was a severely mentally ill guy who had all kinds of anxiety issues, which was marvelous. I got to be an Irish old guy who thought he owned the ocean, which was marvelous. Uh, I got to be a guy with, you know, had the beginnings of dementia, which was sort of sad but marvelous as well. And the thing about all of that it hasn't been me. It's been seeing these folks who could tell you the color of your shoes before they could tell you the color of your eyes because they never would look up. I mean, they were that sort of down and out. Mm -hmm. Get a part in a play, and maybe one or two lines, maybe that's all it was. But six or eight weeks later, they're up on stage with their family members sitting out in an audience, and they're performing on an equal par with the executive director and whomever. We were all players on the same stage, and none of us had title. We were just actors who relied on each other equally. Uh, and 
the learnings that came out of that, the changes that I've seen in some of the people that we serve, the growth that I've seen in them, the, the pride that their parents have, um, you know, the reality that most people would be terrified to be on a stage. Uh, yet these people who, you know, as course, part of their normal course are terrified, just of life in many cases, get up on stage and perform and contribute. And at the end of the day, they can say, we did it. And if, what, a, what a, an accomplishment that has been. So I've gone out of my way to be sure that, you know, I show up for the auditions and, you know, get the parts and I work hard at them. And we just finished, uh, yes, Virginia, there was a Santa Claus, um, because now it's gotten to the point where we do three or four shows in St. Clair County. Uh, we do two in Lapeer and two in Sandlake County. And we sell out. It's, it's great. It's, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. Is it top drawer theater? I'm guessing no. Uh, but we have fun. The audience has fun. But you know when you hear that uh, so many people, their biggest fear is public speaking, and then you think about what gets accomplished with a number of your clients and mm -hmm. people who get involved with this, it is. It's amazing. Well, it... And, and, you know, they themselves will, will talk about, you know, I never thought, you know, I could do that. Or, uh, and we've certainly had situations where we got up to the last minute and somebody said, oh, I can't do it. And so it's, it's a little different than a mm -hmm. normal theater group. And we've had mm -hmm. challenges uh, uh, along the way and people having to fill in and things. But, uh, you know, the vast majority. And, and then, you know, to see their family members, uh, it's... it's um, it's it's a beautiful it's a beautiful thing and it's a mode of expression that you know it's it's pretty non-traditional and you get to be somebody else you know I, and you know my mother was frightened when she before she passed away she had come to see me uh, and I was Mr. Potter in It's a Wonderful Life the banker mm -hmm. who's you know screws over everybody and I was probably the meanest Mr. Potter that you could ever imagine and my mother afterwards said. Oh, you really frightened me. You sounded a lot like your father. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, how about this? Mike McCartan, if you had one do-over in your life, is there a do-over out there that you would have liked to have done a little bit differently? No regrets. I, I don't believe looking in the rearview mirror. It's, it's uh, you know, if you live in yesterday, you feel bad. If you live in the future, you feel nervous. So I just live in the day. What would you... Uh, uh, hope uh, is to be remembered for? I, I would say it, it was for being there. Uh, you know, I, I, would, I would hope that um, that's what the memory would be, that when somebody needed something, I, I didn't need to be begged or cajoled or whatever. If, if I could do it, I was there. And, and I say that because I think it's a privilege to be in a position where you can be there. I've been in some very difficult situations, um, you know, involving loss of life, et cetera, with family members and others. And, and when, it, when people think about those situations, they think, gosh, I wish there was something that I could do. Well, I, I think there is something I can do, and I certainly learned how to do some of those things. And so when those things happen, I, I feel like I can be there and I can do something and, and I can provide some relief, some soothing, some healing to people and that's, that's a privilege and that's what I want to do is just, just to be there. Sounds great. For our listeners at home, this has been a conversation with Mike McCartan uh, from St. Clair. Uh, we are going to run these programs uh, occasionally and if you are aware of somebody who you feel would be a a guest that has a story to share, please contact us at uh, CTV Channel 6. We'd be more than happy to have an, another conversation. For our station, for our listening audience, I'd like to say thanks, Mike, for the Thank interview. You. My pleasure.